Good morning. It is October the 28th, and we are here to read through the Bible again today. We are reading through the Bible in a year. You probably have picked this up from my YouTube page. And right here, right in this uh, folder, you will find all of the videos, uh, probably 365, maybe 366, uh, to be able to read through the Bible in a year, all of the verses. Now, uh, this particular reading, every day we read full chapters. So, in other words, like today, we're reading Psalms 125. Jeremiah 28 and 29, 2 Timothy, we're getting into the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1 and Proverbs 13. So in other words, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we are reading five chapters today. We probably will read four chapters at the very minimum. And many times, that is per day, and many times we will read multiple chapters, more than five, sometimes six and seven chapters in a day. Uh, we are reading through the book of Proverbs every month, uh, and then we read through the rest of the Bible in a year's time, plus a lot of articles that pertain to our founding fathers and what they believed about the Bible, which also was uh, what helped them to create uh, the America, the Americas that we have today. And so <clears throat> let's start by getting into the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 125, and we will begin there for today. Psalm 125, a song of ascents. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. <clears throat> As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, <clears throat> lest the righteous reach out their hands to iniquity. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. As for such as turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them away with the workers of iniquity. Peace be upon Israel. Amen. And we say peace be upon Israel. Amen. We are turning in our Bibles to the next uh, set of chapters, Jeremiah. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, and we are going to read chapters 28 and 29. Here is chapter 28. <clears throat> and it happened in the same year, at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azar the prophet, who was from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and of all the people. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. And I will bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah who went to Babylon, says the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. 
Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people who stood in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. The Lord do so. The Lord perform your words which you have prophesied to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all who were carried away captive from Babylon to this place. Nevertheless, hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who have been before me and before you of old prophesied against many countries and great kingdoms of war and disaster and pestilence. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and broke it. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people. Thus says the Lord, even so I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah. Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, You have broken the yokes of wood, but you have made in their place yokes of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. I have given him the beasts of the field also. Then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, but you make this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will cast you from the face of the earth. This year you shall die, because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Chapter number 29. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. This happened after Jeconiah the king, the queen mother, the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city, where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them. After seventy years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future 
and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you. And I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. Because you have said, the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. Therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the king who sits on the throne of David, concerning all the people who dwell in this city, and concerning your brethren who have not gone out with you into captivity. Behold, I will send on them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and will make them like rotten figs that cannot be eaten. They are so bad. And I will pursue them with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence, and I will deliver them to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, an astonishment, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them, because they have not heeded my words, which I sent to them by my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them. Neither would you heed. Therefore hear the word of the Lord, all you of the captivity, whom I have sent from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab of Kaliah, and Zedekiah, the son of Maaseah, who prophesy a lie to you in my name. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall slay them before your eyes. And because of them, a curse shall be taken up by all the captivity of Judah who are in Babylon, saying, The Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire because they have done disgraceful things in Israel, have committed adultery with their neighbors' wives, and have spoken lying words in my name, which I have not commanded them. Indeed, I know and am a witness, says the Lord. You shall also speak to Shimeah the Nehelamite, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, you have sent letters in your name to all the people who are at Jerusalem, to Zephaniah, the son of Maaseah, the priest, and to all the priests, saying, The Lord has made you priest instead of Jehoiada, the priest, so that there should be officers in the house of the Lord over every man who is demented and considers himself a prophet, that you should put him in prison and in the stocks. Now, therefore, why have you not rebuked Jeremiah, of Anathoth, who makes himself a prophet to you. For he has sent to us in Babylon, saying, This captivity is long. Build houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat their fruit. Now Zephaniah the priest read this letter in the hearing of Jeremiah the prophet. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Send to all those in captivity saying, Thus says the Lord concerning Shemaiah the Nehelamite, Because Shemaiah has prophesied to you, and I have not sent him, and he has caused you to trust in a lie. Therefore thus says the Lord, Behold, I will punish Shemaiah the Nehelamite and his family. He shall not have anyone to dwell among this people, nor shall he see the good that I will do for my people, says the Lord, because he has taught rebellion against the Lord. <clears throat> wow. I would say any kind of reading that you would like to read, <clears throat> poetic, dramatic, <laughs> whatever kind of reading you like, you will find it 
in the Bible. Amen. Jeremiah 28 and 29. We're going to go to a new book today. <clears throat> we finished up 1 Timothy yesterday. And so today we are going to go to 2 Timothy in chapter number 1. 2 Timothy. I need to get there myself. 2 Timothy in chapter number 1. The Second Epistle of Paul the Apostle <clears throat> to Timothy. Greetings from Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers, night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and, and your, your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. And that is chapter 1 as we begin 2 Timothy. Now we're going to go back to the book of Proverbs. <clears throat> this is also where we are going to find our article reading for today. And we are in Proverbs and chapter 13. <clears throat> Proverbs, Proverbs, chapter 13. A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. A man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the unfaithful feeds on violence. He who guards his mouth preserves his life but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. A righteous man hates lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and comes to shame. Righteousness guards him whose way is blameless, but wickedness overthrows the sinner. 
There is one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing, and one who makes himself poor, yet has great riches. The ransom of a man's life is his riches, but the poor does not hear rebuke. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. By pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished, but he who gathers by labor will increase. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. He who despises the word will be destroyed, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. Every prudent man acts with knowledge but a fool lays open his folly. A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful ambassador brings health. Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction, but he who regards a rebuke will be honored. A desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Evil pursues sinners, but to the righteous, good shall be repaid. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of a sinner is stored up for the righteous. Much food is in the fallow ground of the poor, and for lack of justice there is waste. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. The righteous eats to the satisfying of his soul, but the stomach of the wicked shall be in want. And that finishes our reading for today. That was Proverbs chapter 13, and now we have an article <clears throat> entitled, The Virtue of Hard Work. In all labor there is profit. Among the many biblical virtues to be incorporated into our daily lives is that of hard work. From the beginning... God commanded, Six days you shall labor, Exodus 29 and Deuteronomy 5, 13. Notice that God does not say can labor, but rather shall labor. God said to work hard for six days and then have a day of rest. For centuries, the work week was six days, but in the past century was reduced to five, and across Europe and in many parts of America, the push is being made to reduce it to four. The number of hours of work actually performed in any week has been steadily declining. There is a push for less work and more free time. But the Bible encourages just the opposite. Notice some of its many verses praising hard work. In all labor there is profit. Proverbs 14.23 He who tills his land will have plenty of bread. Proverbs 12.11 and the deeds of a man's hands will return to him. Proverbs 12, 14. <clears throat> he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, 
so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Ephesians 4.28 Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and work with your hands so that you will not be in any need. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> he, also who, uh, he also who is slack in his work is brother to him who destroys. Proverbs 18, verse number 9. Recognizing the clarity of this Bible teaching, John Adams thus declared, Suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their own law book, and every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts there exhibited. Every member would be obligated in conscience to temperance and frugality and industry or hard work. Adams recognized that if you lived and guided your life by the Bible, your conscience would oblige or require you to work hard. Hard work is a biblical teaching, but it must also be accompanied by morality. For hard work in an immoral cause will not bring the promised biblical reward. Founding Father John Jay understood this and affirmed that America had become prosperous because the spirit of hard work in the early colonists had properly been joined with that of virtue and morality. Under the auspices and direction of divine providence, our forefathers removed to the wilds and wilderness of America. By their industry, hard work, they made it a fruitful, and by their virtue, a happy country. Because hard work, what the founders termed industry, was such an important biblical trait, they inculcated it in their children from their earliest years. As John Adams reminded his wife Abigail, the education of our children is never out of my mind. Train them to virtue. Habituate them to industry, hard work, activity, and spirit. Thomas Jefferson similarly told his daughter, It is your future happiness which interests me, and nothing can contribute more to it, moral restitude always accepted, than the contracting a habit of industry and activity. Of all the cankers or enemies of human happiness, none corrodes with so silent yet so baneful an influence as indolence, laziness, body and mind both unemployed, our being existence becomes a burden, and every object about us loathsome, even the dearest. <clears throat> Other founding fathers prominent in the field of education, also stress the importance of teaching this trait to youth. For example, Declaration signer Benjamin Rush said that students must, above all, learn to love life and endeavor to acquire as many of its conveniences as possible by industry and economy or in other words, by hard work 
and savings. Noah Webster, the schoolmaster to America, similarly told students, Labor is one of the best uh, <laughs> preservatives. Let me say this again. Labor is one of the best preservatives both of health and of moral habits. Notice that Webster, like so many other founders, associated labor with morals. Declaration signer John Witherspoon likewise declared, Habits of industry or hard work prevent the introduction of many vices and are intimately connected with sobriety and good morals. Idleness is the mother or nurse of almost every vice, and want or lust, which is its inseparable companion, urges men on to the most abandoned and destructive courses. Industry, therefore, is a moral duty of greatest moment, absolutely necessary to national prosperity and the sure way of obtaining the blessing of God. The founders believed that hard work and morals were inseparably connected and that one facilitated the other. They even attributed the generally increased immorality found in cities to the reduced opportunities for hard work and increased leisure time found there. In the country, a normal workday often extended from sunup to sundown, but not so in the city, and morals generally suffered as a result. For this reason, Thomas Jefferson told Benjamin Rush, I view great cities as uh, pestilential to the morals, the health, and the liberties of man. Dr. Rush, not only an educator, but also America's most famous physician, replied, <clears throat> I agree with you in your opinion of cities. Coper, the poet, very happily expresses our ideas of them compared with the country. God made the country, man made cities. I consider them in the same light that I do abscesses on the human body, as reservoirs of all the impurities of a community. James Madison agreed, pointed out, "'Tis not the country that peoples fill either the bridewells or jails or the bedlams or mental institutions. These mansions of wretchedness are tenants from the distresses and vice of overgrown cities." <clears throat> this is not to say that the influences of cities cannot be overcome. For the real problem is not cities themselves, but rather the reduced opportunity for extended hard work. Therefore, the solution <clears throat> is finding more opportunities to engage in it rather than avoid it. Incidentally, President Ronald Reagan would take one month every year during his presidency to return from Washington, D.C. to his ranch in California to swing an axe, wield a chainsaw, dig holes for posts, and build fence. All hard physical labor. Booker T. Washington head of the famous Tuskegee Institute, long ago uh, uh, affirmed to students. No man can read the Bible and be lazy. 
Christianity increases a man's wants and therefore increases his capacity for labor. So whether living in the city or the country, look for opportunities to engage in hard work and avoid laziness as the plague it is, remembering that the Bible clearly affirms in all labor there is profit. And that is the reading for today. Uh, you may want to hear that again. Isn't that interesting that hard labor uh, has so many positive benefits and we find that hard labor in the Word of God? Have a wonderful rest of your day and we will see you again tomorrow.